please welcome Dr. Joya Creer Perry. So I'm gonna tell you a story. It's a story about life, its very beginnings, and two often tragic endings. I'm talking about maternal mortality, women dying during and after childbirth. Over the 20th century in America, the number of women who died in childbirth each year dropped by almost 99%, a feat of modern medicine. And like we do in the United States here, we pat ourselves on the back for this problem, problem solved. And while other countries doubled down on their efforts to meet UN goals surrounding maternal death rates, we stopped paying attention. As a result, today, the US is facing a public health crisis. In the past two decades alone, the maternal, maternal mortality rate in America has more than doubled. We are the only industrialized nation where rates are actually rising. Even though we spend more money on health care than any other country. And as is true for so many of the problems we face in this country, black women like me suffer disproportionately. In fact, there, we are more than three times more likely than white women to die from pregnancy related complications. Here in the beautiful New York City, it's even worse. A black woman is 12 times more likely to die during or after childbirth than a white woman. What's particularly troubling is this. These disparities persist even when controlling for socioeconomic factors such as income, education, even whether or not a mother has health insurance. So what's going on? I first started asking myself that question after giving birth to my own child. I was in my fourth year of medical school when I went into labor four months early, just halfway through my second trimester. My son was born weighing just under a pound. Thankfully today, he's a healthy 20-something-year-old who doesn't call his mother enough, right? Yeah. At the time, I had none of the usual risk factors that accompany premature birth. I was married, I was in medical school, my father is a doctor, my mother's a pharmacist. I barely had any alcohol in the house, at least back then. But the truth is, my only risk factor was being black. But in America, that alone can be the difference between life and death. So I've spent my career just trying to make sense of this injustice. And while my work centers on racism and genderism in the American healthcare systems, these inequalities are born of classism, casteism, tribalism, fundamentalism, paternalism, and on and on. Prejudice, I'm sure you've all seen in your own countries, can take any form. And without a concentrated effort to address it, it will. Here in the United States, this prejudice against black mothers goes all the way back to the very beginnings of modern gynecology. Dr. J. Marion Sims, historically known as the father of gynecology, began his practice by performing experimental vaginal surgeries without anesthesia on a group of enslaved black women. Their names were Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy. I always try to say their names because their stories deserve to be remembered too. <laughs> Dr. Sims claimed these experiments were justified because black women could supposedly endure higher levels of pain than white women. Until just two years ago, a statue of Surgeon Sims stood right here over there in Central Park. Today, the statue's gone. Yay, thanks, activists. <laughs> but somehow, this cruel notion he perpetuated or not. In 2016, a study in an elite American university showed that a quarter of the school's medical residents believe that black people have thicker skin than whites. This is not a metaphor. They meant it literally. These are doctors who have graduated and are treating patients. Studies also confirm that when black people bring up pain to their doctors, they are likely to be dismissed, ignored, or sent home without treatment. But more melanin does not mean we can tolerate more pain. We know this. We proved that there's no biological difference between the races when we completed the Human Genome Project 16 years ago. And we should have known that long ago. So it's not race that's the problem. It's racism. The problem that's a lot older than America and that's not just unique to our medical system. From housing to jobs to education to getting a loan at the bank, black Americans have historically been sent to the back of the bus 
and the bottom of the application pile. It still happens today. And we're often seen as less, even, even if we're ever seen at all. And that's because our institutions, our laws, our culture were built with a bias, a bias in our country against black Americans. And this bias has been deadly. Black women who start prenatal care have higher rates in the first trimester, have higher rates of infant mortality than non-Hispanic white women with no prenatal care at all. Black mothers with college degrees have higher rates of harm than women of all races without high school diplomas. Black women who live in wealthy neighborhoods in the United States would have worse health outcomes than white, Hispanic, and Asian mothers in poor neighborhoods. These are the facts a lot of people don't know. There are facts a lot of us don't want to know, but we have to face up to them if we're going to turn them around. And that's where I have some hope. See, I'm not all bad news. <laughs> the beauty here is that valuing people differently based on gender and race is a choice, and we can change our choices. We can choose to value everyone equally. We can counteract our own biases by trusting facts and numbers over faulty perceptions. My work at the National Birth Equity Collaborative and the Black Mamas Matter Alliance is all about finding solutions that work. We collaborate with hospitals and local communities to establish meaningful standards for respectful care, which can help ensure that black women are being heard by providers. We invest in better research, offer training, and advocate for legislation to protect mothers' lives. And data collection is a huge part of these solutions because we don't value what we don't measure and we don't measure what we don't see. This true holds true around the world. I recently presented at the UN with the health minister of Uganda, a country that counts every maternal death. Why? Because the average mom in Uganda has six babies, so the death of one mother has huge ramifications for her family and her community. Meanwhile, here in the United States, we don't keep a precise record of maternal deaths. We estimate a range of 700 to 900 per year, as if the difference between those two numbers don't represent 200 shattered families. So part of my work is about the straightforward but critical task of counting and valuing women, specifically black women. So we push for policy change by advocating for a metric score to keep track of black women and how they are treated in the hospital. Were their voices listened to? Were their reports of pain taken seriously? We are collecting numbers for these problems so we can analyze them and address them. This kind of data collection is useful no matter where you are. It reduces the role of our biases play in preventing each person from receiving thorough, respectful care. And in the end, that's what we're all searching for, right? A system that treats everyone equally, where black women, white women, and everyone else gets the same standard of care. People ask me all the time, why do you do this work? You're not really going to end racism, they tell me. But they misunderstand my goal. My goal is to make equality, real equality, so normal that you can not just feel it, you can measure it. And with enough honesty, training, and openness to change, I believe that's possible, not only here in the United States, but in every country that we all call home. Thank you.